on behalf of Dan Kenstrom, our faculty director, and all of us here at Boston College Law School, welcome to today's recorded conversation with the three Democratic candidates running in the September 6th primary for Attorney General of the Commonwealth, Andrea Campbell, Shannon Liss Reardon, and Quentin Palfrey. I do want to note that Jay McMahon, the Republican candidate, was invited and due to a conflict declined. This was always intended as a bipartisan forum. For those of you who don't know us, at the Rappaport Center, we convene leaders of public policy and law to delve into important issues affecting individuals and communities. Issues including, but not limited to, criminal justice, student debt, election laws, housing, environmental justice, and education. We also bring public sector luminaries to campus to serve as Rappaport Distinguished Visiting Professors. This semester, we've been honored to have former Senator Doug Jones of Alabama with us, and what a semester to have him here. We were very excited to celebrate with him the historic confirmation of soon-to-be Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. Civic engagement, particularly on the state and local levels, is at the forefront of the Rappaport Center's mission, promoting public service and inspiring law students to enter the public sector is the guidepost that Jerry and Phyllis Rappaport established more than 20 years ago when they created the Rappaport Center. We miss Jerry Rappaport who passed away this past December, so in memory and honor of him, what could be better? than hosting three of the candidates running for Attorney General of the Commonwealth. The AG's office has tremendous breadth and depth. The Attorney General is one of six constitutional officers in Massachusetts and serves as our chief law enforcement officer. The People's Law Office works to protect and defend us proactively and reactively in both criminal and civil matters in issues and cases ranging from gun control to housing discrimination to workers' rights to human trafficking, drug offenses, and environmental protection, the AG wields enormous power to make the Commonwealth safer, cleaner, more equitable, with community and individual rights as foundational principles of justice. I consider myself one of the privileged lawyers in this Commonwealth for having spent 10 years of my own career in the Attorney General's office, eight under Scott Harshbarger, two under Tom Riley. In full disclosure, Scott Harshbarger is chair of the Rappaport Center Advisory Board, and in his usual inimical fashion, he directed me to have this program and to make it happen. So thank you to the general, thank you to the candidate, and to Bill Walczak, who also helped. My colleagues from the AG's office at least one of them, Professor Mike Cassidy, is in this room today, were among the smartest, most thoughtful, hardest working people I have ever met. The work was exciting, intellectually stimulating, and meaningful. The office truly has the power to change lives. For all the law students here in person and watching via Zoom, I highly encourage you to consider working in an AG's office, and likely one of these three people sitting here at these tables will be our next Attorney General. We're very fortunate to have such highly qualified individuals running for an office that has the power to impact us all. So now let me introduce our moderator for today's conversation, a superstar journalist as well as a lawyer, Kimberly Atkins Store senior opinion writer and columnist at the Boston Globe, and lead columnist for The Emancipator, which just launched joint venture by Globe Opinion and the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research that reimagines the 19th century abolitionist newspapers to reframe the current national conversation on racial justice. Kim is the author of The Emancipator's newsletter, Unbound. She is also an MSNBC contributor, guest host for On Point, co-host of the weekly Politica and Legal News podcast, Sisters in Law, and a political commentator on so many TV and radio shows, including CNN, NBR, Fox News, NBC, PBS, and more. And notably for today's event, before launching her journalism career, 
Kim was a trial and appellate lawyer here in Boston. She's a native of Michigan, a graduate of Wayne State University, Boston University School of Law, Boston University College of Communication, and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. And before I welcome her, I believe Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan is here or was intending to be here, so we welcome her. And now, please welcome Kimberly Atkins Store. Thank you so much, Lissy, for that very generous introduction. I'm going to keep my comments at the top very short. The questions that I'll be asking today uh, come primarily from the requests for questions that we sent out ahead of time to uh, the community, as well as members of the press. There, I had given no priority to the press in selecting of these questions because this is an educational event. Um, but rather than just keep questions at the end, I'm going to be incorporating them throughout based on the subject matter. And rather than introdu introducing the candidates myself, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I will say that the order that they went in was chosen randomly ahead of time. And so I will begin with Quentin. Good afternoon. I'm Quentin Palfrey. I'm a proud uh, former assistant attorney general running for AG. Um, as a former assistant attorney general, I've seen firsthand how much impact the AG's office can have on people's lives. So when Trump was in office, it was inspiring to see the AG fight back again and again and again against a corrupt and immoral administration. But now more than ever, we need the people's lawyer to lead on the issues that affect us the most. Racial injustice, the climate crisis, attacks on our democracies, attacks on workers' rights, reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights, student loan debt, housing costs, gun violence. We have so much work to do. The opioid crisis and the coronavirus pandemic have laid bare so many of the shortcomings in our healthcare system. I was the first chief of the healthcare division in the AG office at the time that we were implementing Massachusetts health reform. We worked really hard to make sure that everyone had access to high quality, affordable health care. I sued some predatory health insurance companies that were lying to Massachusetts residents during that critical time. I strongly believe we need to head towards a single payer system System, but the AG can be a really strong voice for the people, as recently when the AG sued Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family, whose lies brought us the opioid crisis. The AG can also help build an economy that works for everyone. I had the great honor to serve in the White House under President Barack Obama as senior advisor for jobs and competitiveness. On day one of the Biden-Harris administration, I came back in as acting general counsel of commerce, led a team of several hundred lawyers and helped to launch the Build Back Better agenda. We need an economy that works for everyone, not just the ultra-rich, not just big corporations. And the AG needs to fight for consumers and workers, fighting against wage theft, fighting against Uber and Lyft, who are trying to misclassify workers and take away their benefits, fighting for a fair share amendment to ask the people at the top to pay a little bit more so we can invest in transportation and in education. And while we're talking about education, we need an education system that makes sure that every child in Massachusetts has access to a world-class education. Where you live and the color of your skin should not determine what kind of an education your children get. And yet we're almost 70 years after Brown versus Board of Education. Our school system is still segregated and radically unequal. And as the chief law enforcement office in the Commonwealth, the AG needs to fight for educational justice. And I disagree with those who say that expanding uh, charter schools is the solution to that. I think that undermines teachers, undermines collective bargaining, siphons away resources, picks winners and losers. The real solution is to invest in our communities and our public schools, invest in early education, make sure that every child gets a world-class education. The AG needs to bring urgency to the fight for racial injustice in other ways as well. The murder of George Floyd and the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict are just the most recent reminders that there are two justice systems in America. We imprison too many people for too long for doing too little. Race has too much to do with who ends up in the criminal justice system. The AG needs to lead on criminal justice reform, on corrections oversight, on, uh, on police accountability, and finally overseeing uh, the state police. The AG needs to bring urgency to the fight against the climate crisis, which is going to determine what kind of a life our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren 
children face, needs to fight back against attacks on reproductive rights with Roe versus Wade under attack, attacks on LGBTQ rights. But at bottom, we need to defend our democracy. And I've spent a good deal of my career on this. I led a team of about 4,000 lawyers for President Obama in Ohio in 08. I founded a national voter protection organization called the Voter Protection Corps. Our, liter our democracy is literally under attack. An armed mob stormed to the Capitol to try to disrupt the peaceful transition of power. And yet the biggest threat to our democracy is corporate money in our elections. We've seen since Citizens United corporate money flooding into our elections. In 2016, charter school backers like Walton, the Walton family and Bloomberg uh, flooded money into a ballot initiative. In the 2021 mayor's race, that corporate money flooded into super PACs supporting and opposing candidates. We're seeing that money flood into our elections right now with Uber and Lyft buying millions of dollars of ads to affect this election. And I'm calling on my opponents to sign a people's pledge and shut down their super PACs. Uh, this is a people's pledge. It's something that Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown signed in 2012. This is something that Ed Markey and Steve Lynch signed in 2013. We need to get corporate money out of our elections. There are very big policy differences in this race on things like single payer health care, on how we deal with the war on drugs, on charter schools, on fair free transit, on police accountability, on how we deal with housing costs. But at bottom, this issue of clean elections is fundamental to this race. If we want an AG who will fight for universal access to health care, we cannot have for profit companies flooding money into super PACs. If we want an AG who will stand up for an economy that works for everyone, we cannot have Bain Capital funding super PACs. If we want to rein in housing costs, we can't have developers flooding that money. And if we want the AG to take urgent action on our climate crisis, we have to have AG candidates sign a no fossil fuel pledge. So if I'm AG, I pledge to be the people's lawyer, to be truly independent, because that's what the people's lawyer does. That's the kind of AG I want to be, and I'm really excited to have this conversation here today. Andrea? Um, thank you, Kimberly, and, and thank you uh, to this incredible institution for having us. And thank you all for being here and being a part of the conversation. I don't know where the camera is, but thank you to our Zoom participants as well. I really appreciate it. And it takes a lot to organize and make sure the food showed up on time. So I want to first extend gratitude. Um, I am Andrea Campbell, and I'm a candidate, of course, for attorney general. I actually jumped into the race really recognizing that as we all sit in this room and, frankly, on Zoom, that families right now in Massachusetts are struggling. And they're very worried about whether or not they're going to be able to rebound, to thrive, and to prosper coming out of COVID. At the same time, they're extremely frustrated with government and don't necessarily see government as a solution to anything they're grappling with every single day. But I'm not leading with a pessimistic message. At the same time, I have been stressing that we live in the best state in the nation and that government indeed can actually help residents who are grappling with a whole array of issues, especially the Attorney General's office. And how do I know we live in the best state in the nation? I'm actually living proof. I had a childhood filled with incredible instability when I was eight months old, my mom actually died in a car accident going to visit my father, who was incarcerated at the time. My father and my brothers cycled in another prison system, and my twin brother, Andre, would die 10 years ago this year, while on the custody of the Department of Correction as a pretrial detainee when he was only 29 years old. I'm the first in my family to go to college. I'm the first in my family to go to law school, and I've dedicated my entire life, both personally and professionally, to making sure every resident in this state has access to the same opportunities I had growing up here. And I've done that in different ways. I actually started my legal career representing families and students for free in education cases, especially students with disabilities and families that fell below the poverty line, pushing for them to have actually access to a high quality education that they were entitled to. I've worked in state government as an attorney for Governor Deval Patrick, where I handled a whole host of agencies for him, the transportation agencies, all of the education agencies. I drafted legislation for the governor, reviewed it for him, also handled the Commission Against Discrimination and of course worked with the Attorney General's office on a whole array of matters. And I've also ensured that every resident in the state has access to opportunity serving as a local elected official in the city of Boston. 
And I'm running for attorney general really stressing that this office and I heard Lissy's opening remarks talking about it and referring to it as a chief law enforcement office, that it's more than that. It's more than just a chief law enforcement office. It has all the tools, the resources, and certainly the talent to make sure every family in this state has access to health care, a high quality education for their children, which is important to me. I have two beautiful boys. Of course, making sure you have access to a living wage, all the tools to stay in your home, to buy a home, to grow your wealth, everything to deal with public corruption, to ensure our communities are safe while making sure our public safety agencies are the most transparent and accountable in the nation, all the tools to protect us against predatory practices, especially our seniors, every tool to ensure the neighborhoods in which we live or are raising our children, that those neighborhoods are safe, more resilient and of course prepared for the next climate event or even the next pandemic. I'm really excited and honored to be a candidate in this race because that office indeed is a special office that absolutely can help residents and businesses with their daily struggles. I'm honored to have the support in this race already of Senator Markey, former Congressman Kennedy, over 90 elected officials representing every single county in the state. We launched a Gateway Cities tour that has taken us into communities like Chelsea, Brockton, actually I'm going to Brockton, I haven't been there yet, but I'm, oh, I'm going back to Brockton, I should say, Pittsfield, Springfield, Worcester, you name it, really going into those communities that feel left out and left behind. Not just saying it, actually showing up, and we know our message is resonating, but I'm not taking anything or anyone for granted. So I'm really honored to be here to answer your questions. I'm gonna keep my remarks short so that you, we can get to your questions, but really honored to be here, and thank you for having me today. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay, working now? Okay, all right, thank you, Kimberly. Thank you so much to the Rappaport Center for hosting this. I'm really looking forward to this conversation that we're going to have. My name is Shannon Liss Reardon. I am very excited about this run for Attorney General. My career has been dedicated to taking on the biggest challenges and delivering big results for regular people. I have spent my entire legal career using the law as a tool to improve people's lives. For the last 23 years, I have represented working people. I have made national headlines, leading teams of lawyers, taking on some of the largest corporations in America, and time and again, we've beaten the odds. We have won against corporations like Starbucks, FedEx, Uber, Amazon, IBM, my alma mater, Harvard University, which I have proudly sued at least four times. <laughs> I have represented all types of working people from waitresses to janitors to construction workers, firefighters, Uber drivers, strippers, and helped them recover hundreds of millions of dollars that corporate America stole from them. This work has changed industries across Massachusetts and throughout the country. And I'm very proud of the fact that I've spent my career fighting for the people against the powerful and winning, which is exactly what I plan to do for you as your next attorney general. I know that the people of Massachusetts could really use some wins right now. Income inequality is at an all-time high. Corporate bad actors are taking advantage of workers, consumers, and our planet. Unions and the right to organize are under attack. Parents are having to make decisions between childcare and putting food on the table. And the United States Supreme Court is on the verge of taking away nearly 50 years of reproductive freedom. The people of Massachusetts deserve a champion. I know how to use the legal system to make progress on these and so many of the most pressing issues facing us, from fighting systemic race discrimination, standing up for gender equality, and protecting the dignity of work. The work that I've done in my career over the last 20 years has moved industries. About a decade ago, I started fighting for the rights of gig workers to have employment rights, and it's been my work in this area that has sparked a national conversation about the importance of these workers having those rights. Uh, early in my career, I took on the service industry and firmly established the law in Massachusetts that, that tips are for workers, and now hotels, restaurants, airlines, gig companies, they don't steal workers' tips because of the cases I brought and won. 
I consider this race to be a job interview, and I am asking you all to consider my skills, my background, my experience, my passion, and my unparalleled record in delivering meaningful change. As you are deciding who you want to hire to be the next lawyer for the people of Massachusetts, I'm the only candidate in this race who is an actual practicing lawyer. I am the only candidate in this race who has run a law firm. I'm the only one who has won the jury trials, who has won the appeals to help shape our laws to better and more fairly serve the people. I have been an activist lawyer throughout my career, and, and this builds on my early days. I was a women's rights organizer and activist right out of college, which I learned working with the legendary Bella Abzug. I am very proud to have the support already of about 40 unions across Massachusetts representing well more than 150,000 working people across Massachusetts. I, um, I, I've been called the, uh, the workers champion and, and now I'm ready to be Massachusetts champion. Um, and I agree with Quentin uh, um, about the People's Pledge. I, I accepted it when I ran for Senate a couple of years ago and I agree that all three of us should agree to the People's Pledge and say no to corporate PAC money. I will not be beholden to anyone. I will not be beholden to corporations. I take on corporations. I know how to hold them accountable. I have changed their practices. I look forward to continuing and expanding on this work I've been doing as a private attorney general for the last 20 years, now with the power of the state of Massachusetts behind me. I'm Shannon Liss Reardon. I'm running to be your next attorney general. I, I would be honored and privileged to have your vote. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all for your opening uh, remarks. I will begin with my question as somebody who is an alum of several local Boston news organizations, I think all of them but one I've worked for at one point or another. I'm starting with some local issues. Um, I will first address this question to Andrea. What is the Attorney General's role in addressing and solving the ongoing drug treatment, mental health, and crime crisis at Mass and Cass? Um, thank you for the question. I remember when I was obviously on the city council in Boston um, doing a lot of work to address the opioid crisis, homelessness crisis, and the mental health crisis at Mass and Cass, which continues, of course, to be a major issue in the, in the city. But I, I want to broaden it because we have, as I remarked earlier, we launched a Gateway Cities tour. And we are going into municipalities, including municipalities outside of 495 in the western part of the state. And what is coming up quite a bit is the opioid crisis, is other, of course, uh, drug addiction, high rates of alcoholism, suicide, not just amongst adults, but also amongst young people. High levels of depression, anxiety, suicide. So this is going to be a major issue that the AG's office is going to have to grapple with. And I think there's a few ways in which to do it. One is making sure that every community actually has access to mental health care. Right now, there are many, organiz many organizations, many communities, whether communities of color, some of our rural communities, some of our poorer communities, low-income communities, that do not have access to accessible, affordable health care, especially in the context of behavioral health. The AG's office has a critical role to ensure that. They even can bring resources to bear to invest in local organizations, including community-based nonprofit organizations that are providing gender-affirming care in some of these communities, resources to bear to invest in those institutions. The second is you have a bully pulpit. We need to be naming that there is a mental health crisis in this state, which leads to folks, of course, relying on substances and other things to cope. These are coping mechanisms in many ways. We need to be naming that. We need to be talking about that. It's bigger than just an opioid crisis. We have a mental health crisis going forward. I think the next AG is going to have to name it like our current AG names the opioid crisis as a major issue. This is a major issue. And when you do that, more people come into the fold to partner in that work and to, of course, make a difference. Lastly, I don't know what the time limit is, but lastly, I will just stress, in addition to that, there is a way in which to make sure that in a to, in addition to funding organizations that provide care and services, if we're talking about young people in particular, we have to connect it to the education system. I was just in a meeting with a, the mayor of Fall River. He named two of the biggest issues in his community, housing 
and the mental health and well-being of young people. He's a former principal of a school. They have some guidance counselors and other behavioral health specialists in their schools, but they're still struggling. This is a major issue. There are major gaps across our state in our educational system. So it's broader than mass and caste. It's broader than adults. It also includes young people. Greater investments in our school districts is critically important and our higher ed institutions. Obviously, some higher ed institutions have more resources than others, critically important. Quentin? So the war on drugs has been a colossal and disastrous failure. Uh, we are not going to arrest and incarcerate our way out of a set of challenges that are primarily about uh, structural racism, mental health care, substance use disorder, unstable housing. What we need to do is invest in those communities. We need to invest in uh, preventative health care and really try to take these challenges on head on. Um, but this does highlight some of the major differences in this race. Um, if you look at the questionnaires that we've all filled out, I'm in favor of single, health, single payer health care. And one of the reasons for that is that our health care system dramatically underinvests in prevention in the dis chronic disease management, mental health care, substance use disorder, we need to cr create structural incentives for really solving those underlying problems. I also believe in safe injection sites, uh, which one of my opponents has opposed. I think that the war on drugs has failed and we need to experiment with those kinds of solutions to this set of challenges. Um, we also talked about stable health care. There's a difference in this race around housing policy. I've believe that rent control needs to be on the table because too many people are getting priced out of the market for health care. Um, and one of my opponents also opposes rent control. So I would encourage you to look at some of the differences in this race as we actually get down to the brass tacks of how we're going to solve these challenges, how we're going to uh, reform our health care system, our criminal justice system, and our housing system. Shannon. The situation that we've been seeing and that has gotten a lot of attention recently at Mass and Cass is not isolated to that area. This is, this is an issue across the state. In fact, it's an issue across the country. What has happened, how the opioid crisis has, has devastated communities. It's devastated families. We absolutely should not be using our criminal justice system to address this issue, we need to do everything. And as your attorney general, I will do everything to make sure we get the resources and the help to the people who need it. Um, one, of the, one of the great things that Mara Healy has done during her time as attorney general is she's taken on the pharmaceutical industry. This is exactly the type of work that I've been doing for more than 20 years, is taking on big corporations and holding them accountable for the, the harm that they've caused to our families, to our communities. Um, and the, the work she's done there, she, she's gotten some results already, but the work is far from done. Massachusetts needs an attorney general who knows how to lead teams of lawyers to get big results and big changes from corporate America, which is what I have been doing and succeeding at for more than 20 years. So I want to get these corporations who are responsible for this devastation they've caused us to pay. Um, and I want, I will do everything I can as Attorney General to ensure that funds that are used from this litigation goes to help the people who most need it. And, and I agree that the, the problems that we're seeing at Mass and Cass are multifaceted. We have a combination of the opioid crisis. We also are seeing the devastating effects of the affordable housing crisis we have in Massachusetts. Because um, it's, families are just can't afford to get by. It is harder and harder and harder for people to find a place to live that they can afford. As Attorney General, I plan to establish an office that will provide support for tenants, will provide advocacy for tenants. Right now, in housing courts, tenants don't have the representation that landlords have. We need to make sure that these housing courts are not just mills for eviction, but are places where we can get these disputes resolved so people can stay in their homes. This is the type of work that I will do as Attorney General. This is the type of work that I have been doing successfully, figuring out solutions to solve big problems. 
So the next local issue I want to hit on is um, the, uh, the state's legalization of marijuana. What is the Attorney General's role in protecting cannabis businesses amid contradicting federal laws, and specifically with respect to black entrepreneurs who have had a harder time launching and, uh, launching and sustaining successful cannabis businesses? I'll go to you first, Shannon. Yeah, thank you. So, so the cannabis industry, now that it is legal in Massachusetts, is raising a whole host of issues, which is that um, among them, I, I am concerned when a small number of corporations get concentrated power in any area. And unfortunately, that already seems to be happening in the cannabis industry. I think it is crucial now that, um, that decades of misguided policy, which had... Um, um, marred people's records um, for, for using marijuana um, has not been fully righted now simply by the legalization of marijuana. We need to make sure that the opportunities that have been created by this industry are accessible um, and that those communities who are most harmed by the failed policies of the war on drugs are, are helped and that we use every power that we have to make sure that those opportunities are equitably available to people. Um, and, and part of the outstanding issue that, that needs to be addressed with marijuana is that we now have people, we still have people serving in prison. We still have people whose records are still marred from past conduct that is now perfectly legal in the state of Massachusetts. We need to expunge those records. I will be an active partner with the legislature to get the records expunged for those people who have been, um, who have passed arrests and convictions for, for marijuana related offenses as well as other low level drug possession offenses. Um, Andrea? Yes. Um, thank you, Kimberly. So I am the only candidate who actually has helped businesses, especially black owned and black and brown owned businesses actually open up cannabis sites. So in the city of Boston, when I was serving on the council, we actually had the first cannabis shop open up in my district, and it is black owned. Um, and they're about to probably open up a second site in the city of Boston. It was a long and daunting and difficult process to say the least, um, but so far they're doing really well. And so that leadership would continue. I do think the AG's office can actually play a greater role in technical assistance. It also has to do with capital. If you want to see more black and brown or women entrepreneurs in this space, it's going to require investments in capital. The AG's office has done a whole bunch of affirmative policies in different, different spaces. Small businesses working with the next governor, working with financial institutions, it's possible to create funds to actually generate capital for the folks we're talking about to be able to enter this industry um, and to be be able to actually own a business and to grow it. The, the other pieces I want to stress is expungement. We already know that even though this has been legalized, we absolutely need to do something about the people who are sitting in prisons. I'm probably the only candidate that has visited almost a lot of prisons in this state. Susan Baranowski, MCI Norfolk, MCI Shirley, I still have loved ones who are sadly incarcerated. And some of them because of issues related to drugs. And so I do think the AG's office has to play a critical role in looking at expungement and working with the State House to get that done. I'm the only candidate as both an attorney for Governor Deval Patrick and as a local elected to have actually passed legislation at the State House, which is critically important. And in addition to expungement, the last piece is training, whether it's through the Fair, Fair Labor Division or some other unit of the office. There are a lot of folks who don't know what their rights are in the context of employment when it comes to the legalization of marijuana. The federal level, it's restricted. In the state, it's not. You have a lot of employees that are getting into trouble navigating certain types of employers um, because they are not, uh, they are they are under the jurisdiction of our federal laws, not our state laws. So I think basic training for employees and workers is also critically important. And of course, the AG's office can play a role there too. Go ahead, Quinn. So I want to agree enthusiastically with everything that Shannon and Andrea have just said in this space. And I just want to go a little deeper on a couple of these issues. First of all, I mentioned that I think the war on drugs has just been a devastating failure. What it has led to is several decades of over-incarceration, uh, which has had this devastating consequence, particularly in communities of color. The racial disparities in uh, incarceration are just staggering. And uh, when you look at 
at the set of uh, folks who have been uh, incarcerated or at least um, uh, convicted for marijuana offenses, um, retrospectively, uh, those folks suffer. Uh, from uh, the disparate treatment that they faced in the criminal justice system, we need to right that wrong. And you're right, some of those folks are incarcerated, we need to get them out, but we also need to make sure uh, that when they were punished for something uh, in a racially biased kind of a way and are suffering those consequences, that we make that right going forward. The other thing we need to make right going forward uh, is the economic opportunity that's going to emerge from cannabis legalization. So many aspects of our economy me are, are, are staggeringly biased towards the people at the very top um, and biased against communities of color. And as we open up new industries, we need to make sure uh, that the communities that have been most harmed by these bad policies in the past are the ones uh, that get some of the benefit of the economic activity uh, that is created there. Um, Andrea mentioned some of the work that she's done, which, uh, which, which is wonderful. I've also done some work in this space. Um, I was the acting general counsel of the US Department of Commerce. Um, and under the US Department of Commerce sits the Minority Business Development Administration. And one one of its major roles is exactly what we're talking about here, making sure that minority-owned businesses get um, access to the economic opportunities um, that we are creating across the economy. We need to make sure that the cannabis industry, and this is not true at this moment, um, is, uh, do, does benefit um, all of the communities uh, that uh, we serve in the, in the Commonwealth. So I, I think the AG office can play a real role, both in that remedying of the historic in inequities in the criminal justice system and in building an economy that works for all communities. So this next question I've uh, sort of altered from one that was submitted by a member of our audience. I thought it was very good. It was directed at one candidate, and I want to ask it of all of them. Uh, one reason why the faces of all three of our candidates today may be familiar is because in recent years, all three of them have run for other offices, in your case, Quentin, Lieutenant Governor, Andrea for Mayor, uh, and Shannon for U.S. Senate. I will start with you, Quentin. Since you ran so recently for this other office, why specifically are you running for Attorney General now? I love the Attorney General's office. I felt it was a great privilege to be an Assistant Attorney General in that office um, and to be the chief of one of the most important divisions in, the, in that office. Every day when I woke up and went to, to work, I felt like I could have an impact on individual consumers, but also on some really big challenges. I led a case that, uh, in the multi-state context, an insurance bid rigging case that led to a $175 million recovery. Um, I ran the health care division that was imp helping to implement Massachusetts health reform, and we heard from consumers over and over again uh, that predatory health insurance companies were lying to them during that critical time. We had a hotline in my division. We took those cases, tried to help those consumers, but we went to those insurance companies. We sued those insurance companies, and they didn't back down, and neither did we. We had to sue them for a couple of years. We wore them down and wore them down. At the end of that time, we got a big recovery for Massachusetts consumers who had been harmed. But more importantly, we knocked those three predatory health insurance companies out of the jurisdiction at a time when we were raising the bar on the health insurance that was available to people. So I've seen firsthand how much impact the AG can have on people's lives. And I think it's really important to have an AG with direct experience managing government lawyers in the AG office. And also, I managed about 400 lawyers in the Biden administration, including all of the mismanagement of the US Senate census uh, that we inherited from the Trump administration. So I believe my experience directly prepares me to take on this role on day one. Shannon? I have been acting as a private attorney general for my entire career, more than 20 years. Um, the work that I have done has, has put hundreds of millions of dollars back in the pockets of regular people. Uh, the, I believe I'm the most qualified for this role. I believe that the role of attorney general requires a seasoned, experienced attorney, not a politician. I'm, I'm not a politician. I am a, a nationally recognized lawyer who has changed industries. I have led teams of lawyers across the country and coordinated with attorneys general offices, um, not just in Massachusetts, but elsewhere, including California, New York. Massachusetts is and should continue to be a leader, and I look forward to being a leader among attorneys general, 
across the country. When, when I ran for Senate a couple of years ago, I got asked the question a lot, are you gonna run for Attorney General when Ed opens up? And I am very excited to now bring my experience and my passion and my skills and my record to the office to serve you, the people of Massachusetts, as your next lawyer. Andrea? Um, thank you, Kimberly. And thank you for asking us all the question. I, I appreciate that because I'm sure it's directed to me. But um, I, I will say, I, I see this as a continuation of, of my work. And I didn't jump into this race lightly. I talk about my faith uh, freely. I pray all the time. I prayed before I jumped into this race. Um, and most importantly, took that leap of faith thinking about my twin brother, Andre, who did die 10 years ago while in the custody of the Department of Correction as a pretrial detainee when he was only 29 years old. He had a disease called scleroderma, didn't receive adequate health care while in, that custody, in their custody waiting to go to trial for two years, and ultimately met that tragic end. I see the AG's office as the unique office to have done something about that particular case. My family still doesn't know under what conditions or what ha under what circumstances um, he passed. And there are many cases like this of misconduct within our prisons. I think there are a group of folks who may be filing a lawsuit very soon against prisons, uh, bringing forth claims about rape or other things with respect to women uh, who are incarcerated. There are major things happening within our House of Correction and our prison system that absolutely need to be addressed. And not only do I think I'm uniquely qualified to address those issues, for me, the work is personal. And the AG's office is the state's attorney for the DOC in the House of Correction and has the tremendous ability to leverage that power to get these agencies to be more transparent and, of course, more accountable to our constituents and, of course, to those who are incarcerated and to those who work there. So that's the ultimate reason I took the leap of faith. I will stress the other reasons is there are major distinctions between the three of us. I think I come with the most comprehensive legal background. I do come with a legislative background, which I think is critically important for the next AG. And my lived experience is distinct. And I think that also should matter. And I think it also does matter because, as I've heard on the trail already, it connects to the challenges that families are facing every single day. So the next question is more about the nuts and bolts of the job uh, if for the winner of this race. And it's what aspects of your experience, and I do want you to, to call on your experience, uh, that qualify you to run a legal organization of over 600 people, and how will you approach leading that 600 plus employee organization and have a well-established culture and community? I'll start with you, Andrea. Um, thank you. In the past, I obviously have worked, mentioned I worked with Governor Deval Patrick. I've worked in the private sector. I've worked in nonprofit space and for a quasi-state agency. I didn't even mention I was a general counsel at a regional planning agency that covered 101 municipalities in the state, working with general counsels and municipal leaders. Um, and so I've managed teams in the past. I will tell you, it's for me, going into the office is going to require, one, that we look at the diversity of the office. I think that's really important, who you're surrounding yourself with. There's a lot more we can do to ensure that the teams there and the leadership teams are reflective of the communities they serve. It's also going to be really important for me to hire an incredible first assistant. Our current AG, um, Maura Healy, if you don't know her, um, she talks about, at different moments, not loving the management piece. And so she delegates some of that to an incredible first assistant. And why is that important? That a first assistant has to almost be a lawyer's lawyer, which would be true for me too. Um, and in addition to that, um, there is a background that I think is very distinct in terms of education, particularly education law. I'm the only candidate, of course, who have practiced education law, but I don't know that any AG before me has. And so I will prioritize the issue of education, the well-being of our youth, um, not only grade school level, also, of course, in higher ed institutions, which I think is also unique and, and also matters to me. I wouldn't be sitting here but for an excellent education. Quentin? So I think if you look at the experiences um, that we've had um, in previous attorneys general, both in this state and others, it has typically been somebody who has led teams of government attorneys, either in an AG office or in a district attorney office. Um, and I think there's a reason for that, because the attorney general's office is a really unique kind of a place. I was the chief of the healthcare division in the AG office. I've seen firsthand how to use that office. I also worked in the White House under President Barack Obama. I know you mentioned your legislative background. It's very impressive. I also um, led... Um, <laughs> 
I, I, I also was the lead White House staffer on a major piece of legislation. I was proud to brief the president one-on-one -on -one and be there for the signing ceremony. I also led a team of about 400 lawyers in the Commerce Department, managing lawyers who managed lawyers who managed lawyers. And I think it's really important to have an AG who understands how to use the AG office uh, how to do not only uh, the direct litigating, which is an important part of the role, but to understand the subtle ways in which the AG office can be a platform for leading on the really big issues. Um, so take the climate crisis, which I think is one of the ur most urgent things that we face in, in the world today. The AG needs to bring the kinds of cases everybody's accustomed to against ExxonMobil, against Trump. Massachusetts versus EPA is one of the most important uh, US Supreme Court cases in this space. But that's not what you have to to do. You also have to lead on an uh, urgent transition to a clean energy revolution by overseeing energy companies, utility companies. You have to understand how uh, the climate crisis disparately affects communities of color and take it on as a, uh, as a civil rights issue. You need to understand the defensive role uh, where the opportunity to lead on the climate crisis ironically may be strongest when we're advising government agencies, sometimes when they're being sued, and how to use the bully pulpit of the office standing with a bullhorn saying, don't dump radioactive water into Cape Cod Bay, saying, over my dead body, is there going to be a compressor station here? And using the legislative weight that you have. My colleagues in the office at the time that I was there, Maura Healy was at, at, at the same level as me. So was Catherine Clark, who is now the assistant speaker of the House. It's probably going to be the speaker of the House uh, someday. She led our legislative efforts. The AG has an enormous amount of power, um, but you have to understand how to use it. And I think the learning curve for somebody coming from outside of that kind of an environment is much steeper than somebody who has led in the office and led in government offices like this before. Shannon. So again, I think that my experience working as a private attorney general for the last 20 years is the most pertinent experience for this job. This isn't something I've done for a couple of years here or there. For more than 20 years, I have strategized and case by case, industry by industry, changed industries, figured out solutions, and gotten hundreds of millions of dollars back for working people, and those skills are directly transferable to all of the areas of the Attorney General's office getting money back in the pockets of consumers who've been ripped off and deceived by corporations, making sure that we are making the progress we need on climate change. This is why I have called on all the candidates in this race to engage in a debate focused on climate change, and I'm very pleased that both of my opponents have now agreed to have this in-depth discussion about what our priorities and approach will be to making sure that Massachusetts gets to where it needs to be to uh, confront climate change. And the important thing, I hear a lot about passing the right laws. I will absolutely be an activist attorney general partnering with the legislature to make sure the right laws get passed. But you know, laws do not enforce themselves. We need a strong attorney general who knows how to use the legal system, who knows how to lead teams of lawyers to make the change that our laws are designed to address. So I, for, for 20 years, I've led my law firm. I'm the only candidate who has led a law practice for, for 20 years. I have coordinated with and led teams of lawyers across the country. A lot of the issues that we're facing, they're not just local issues, they're not just Massachusetts issues, they're nationwide issues. And I've taken on national players, corporations um, in big tech, um, healthcare, um, the hospitality industry uh, and, and elsewhere. And, I, and I've changed their policies and I've changed their practices. And as an employment lawyer, I have also been particularly sensitive to the needs of the employees who are doing this work. So I think in terms of the culture, which you asked about at the Attorney General's office, I'm in the best position to make sure that we are, that we are treating our staff our investigators, our attorneys at that office as they deserve to be treated with the respect um, and the skills and the tools that they need. I plan to attract the highest qualified attorneys and investigators and staff to make sure that we can fulfill those goals. And I think that uh, diversity is extremely important. I plan, I pledge 
to work hard to make sure that we have diverse representation in the Attorney General's office leading the divisions and making sure that this office is representative of the people and is fighting powerfully for the people. That is the work that I plan to continue in this role. All right, I'd like to turn to the topic of education. The Massachusetts Constitution requires, quote, legislatures and magistrates to, quote, cherish public schools. Do you think the Attorney General has a role in enforcing that promise and ensuring that the state and municipalities are often are offering high quality education for everyone? I ask this uh, keeping in mind that most legislation, most litigation brought concerning schools tends to be brought by citizens and activists and not from the AGO. Shannon, I'll start with you. Um, yes, thank you. Um, our schools, our schools are among our most cherished institutions. I have three. I have three kids. Two are teenagers. One's now in his twenties, and I, I pride. Uh, I'm so proud of the educations that they have been able to receive here in Massachusetts, and I want every child in Massachusetts to be able to receive a top quality education. We are. We are, and need to continue to be a leader. And yes, I believe in the public schools. I am a, um, I, I have a family that comes from the public school tradition. My mother, my grandmother, my brother, my aunts, um, they all taught in the public schools and I absolutely believe we need to be investing in our public schools and I will do everything in my power as attorney general to get our public schools the resources that they need to do the job that they need to do, the most important job of educating our children. Um, it was just in the Globe about a, some, some terrible um, report just came out about what's been happening at one of the Boston schools. And we need to be investigating those situations and making sure that um, administrators are, are not trying to hide from the public what is going on in our schools. As a practicing lawyer, this is the type of work I've done, is figuring out where there are inequities, where there are violations. I am about to file a lawsuit against a public school system in Georgia, working with the NAACP for some pretty harrowing conduct by some teachers and administrators against black students who were trying to uh, plan a peaceful rally to support the Black Lives Matter movement after some white students at the school engaged in rather racist behavior. This is the type of work that, that I've been doing for my whole career, um, enforcing our laws against discrimination that applies absolutely to our schools. We need to make sure that our schools have the, the tools that they need and that our teachers are supported and that, and that our laws are enforced equitably throughout our education system. Andrea? Uh, absolutely. I, I, the AG's office has an incredible role to play in the context of education. And I actually think it's broader in scope than what the office is doing right now. I am passionate about education. One, I'm a product of Boston Public Schools. I went to five of them. Um, and But for a great education in all five of those schools, I wouldn't have made it to a Princeton University. I wouldn't have made it to a UCLA law school um, and come back and been extremely successful. I'm also passionate because that's how I started my legal career representing students for free. All of the families I represented and all of the students I represented fell below the poverty line. These were the families in desperate need of an advocate and a lawyer, and especially in the education context, pushing for students uh, who had access, I'm sorry, pushing for students to have access to a high quality education, representing students in IEP cases, all types of special needs cases, representing school, students in school discipline cases, which we know disproportionately affect students of color. Not just against, and mainly sometimes against, um, Boston Public Schools, but other school districts as well, was in other school districts when students were being pushed out. I'm the only candidate that's not only represented students directly in education cases, but have pushed to hold school systems accountable. Not just traditional public schools, charter schools as well, and other types of school systems, ensuring that they gave our students and delivered on the promise of delivering an excellent education. So there is absolutely a way the AG's office needs to continue to show up on the accountability side, you have the power, of course, as the state's attorney to represent all of these education agencies, to connect with the boards. Um, there is a way to show up, not only in the Boston case that was in the Globe that is extremely disturbing, disturbing, but there are other cases like that that are also disturbing. The other thing I think is really important 
Our current AG has a strategy to address the opioid crisis. It's a four-pronged strategy. The first piece is letting people know and using the bully pulpit to un un for them to understand that these issues are real. That platform should be used to talk about the abysmal literacy rates in certain communities, the lack of access to a high quality education. I live in Mattapan, my two boys have a 5% chance of getting into a high quality Boston public school compared to other neighborhoods where it's 80%. These disparities are real in other communities as well. The AG should be lifting those up every single day, talking about the achievement gaps, the opportunity gaps. The second prong in the strategy the office is using is partnerships partnering with everyone to address these critical issues. The third is using the tools of the office, which I just described a little bit, but the fourth is going after bad actors. And I do think the AG's office has an ability to go after some of these school districts that are not delivering on their promise, especially for low-income residents and students of color that desperately need an education to be successful. There's a lot more the AG's office can do, and I think there's already a strategy in the office being used for climate and the opioid crisis that could be used in the context of education. Quentin. So the state is failing its con constitutional obligations uh, to its young people. Where you live and the color of your skin should not determine what kind of an education your kids get. Brown versus Board of Education sets out uh, this notion that we should have schools that are not segregated and schools that are equal. We are failing that. And the constitutional obligation in the state constitution to provide a free and appropriate public education is an affirmative duty on the part of the state. If we fail to do that, that is a civil rights crisis. And as the chief civil rights officer in the Commonwealth, the AG needs to bring urgency to that issue. But this does highlight two of the biggest differences in this race. One of them is what role, if any, do charter schools play in that? Um, and one of my opponents has been more supportive of expanding charter schools than I am. I think that that is not the answer to this challenge. I think the answer to this challenge is not picking winners and losers, is not undermining collective bargaining. It is saying that every child everywhere in the Commonwealth has an, has a, 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 is, is uh, entitled to a free and appropriate public education. If you live in Brockton, if you live in Lawrence, if you live in Southbridge, if you live in certain neighborhoods of Boston, you should not get a less good education than you get in Weston. And that is our obligation to deal with, and you cannot deal with that just by expanding charter schools, but it goes back to this clean elections issue. So in 2016, these charter school companies, Walton, Bloomberg, they flooded the airwaves with these advertisements. Those, that same money came into the 2021 Boston mayor's race, into PACs, supporting and opposing candidates. That money cannot be the determining force in the right race for AG. Because if you want an AG who is independent of the charter schools, who is actually going to fight for solving for this, there is no place for this Citizens United enabled flood of corporate money. And that's why we need for all the candidates to close their super PACs. And that's why we need all of the candidates to pledge not to let super PACs influence this race. All right, I, I just want to do a lightning round on education because um, I want to get to criminal and other aspects, but just lightning round, and it's something you just brought up for everyone. I'll start with you, Quentin. Do you support keeping a cap on, car on charter schools? I, I, I do think so, yes. Okay. Do you support keeping a cap on charter schools? Yes, I will, but I, I want to preface that okay. because I always take my direction. Don't forget your, oh. your mic. I always take my direction from families. In, in Boston in particular, in my district, there are charter schools. The majority of those students attending those schools are black kids and black students who have been failed by our traditional public schools and are looking for a choice. So while we improve those main traditional systems, we need to be mindful that, that we're not judging the choice of parents who desperately need access to education. And I do not think the AG's role, I think it's the wrong question. AG's role is not to be pushing for the expansion of charter schools. It's to hold these education systems accountable and to push these systems to do better so that black and brown kids actually have access to a high quality education, which is currently not the case in this state. All right. Shannon, cap on charter schools. I support the cap on charter schools. We need to be investing in our public schools. We need to make sure that our public schools are accountable to locally elected school boards. And we need to make sure that collective bargaining is a protected right and that the unions and teachers have their say in how the schools are run. And that, that doesn't happen with charter schools. All right, uh, lightning question number two, reverse order. Do you support receivership for public schools and in Boston in, uh, specifically, Shannon? 
Um, again, no, I, I don't support receivership because I think that the schools need to be accountable to their locally elected officials and um, um, and the represented teachers who make those schools what they are. I think it's a choice for local residents. So in the context of Boston, obviously the mayor, the elect school committee, and the residents themselves, if it gets so bad that we are not delivering on our promise, uh, then maybe that's an option for those local school districts. I do not think that um, that can be something that we decide right now in a lightning round question to be very fair um, because there are just in the just in the at globe article today about what's happening in one of our Boston public schools if you haven't read it you need to it is very disturbing um, and so I do think that's a conversation and a question for our current mayor and she deserves to have that conversation Quentin no I oppose receiverships they've failed they failed in Lawrence they've failed in Southbridge and they're gonna fail in Boston Okay, so as a longtime Supreme Court reporter, this is uh, the top question that I came up with when I was asked to moderate this, so this is what it is. Uh, what will be your plan if the U.S. Supreme Court does, as it seems like it's going to do, strike down the public carry gun laws in California and New York, and uh, Massachusetts has a nearly identical law, so it will be struck down too. Uh, it essentially requires those seeking uh, public carry permits to show cause and gives license issuers discretion on what qualifies as cause. Quentin, what will... Uh, the AG's office, what should the AG's office do in response to that likely ruling striking it down? So this is hard one to deal with as a lightning round question. No, this is, no, this, we've moved <laughs> oh, okay. on. All right. We finished up education. We're yes. moving, I'm sorry, I should have said that more clearly. We're moving on to criminal and related realm. And so this is my first question. It's not lightning, but you know, I, we, we have lots more, so. <laughs> Thank you, because I between. wasn't sure how to do that. In, yeah, no, uh, go ahead, it's an, important, it's an important issue. Look, um, this this is a this is a, a a crisis in our society that Congress has failed to tackle. Our Congress is broken, and what that has meant is that state leadership of the kind that the AG can uh, can be a really big part of is necessary to tackle some of these really big challenges, including the epidemic of gun violence in our community. We are fortunate in Massachusetts uh, that we have better gun laws. Um, the legislature has done a better job and the AG has done a better job. And as a result, we have had better outcomes um, than in other parts of the country. Um, and uh, what we need to do, uh, first of all, is continue to make sure, and to this point, uh, that the legislature helps us to have some of the best gun laws in the country. We need an AG who will take this on with urgency. If the US Supreme Court strikes down uh, one of our protections uh, against uh, that kind of gun violence, we need to work with the legislature um, to uh, pass something that will uh, protect us against uh, that open carry approach. Um, or to continue to fight within the courts. I also want to say that there are several things that in spite of the good leadership that Massachusetts has shown, um, that we need to be really concerned about in the area of gun violence. And let me just sort of mention three challenges. Um, one of them is suicide. Um, so when we think about gun violence, we tend to think about mass shootings. Uh, that tends to be um, sort of what dominates the headlines. But if you actually look statistically and numerically, it ties back in to the set of challenges that we were talking about before. Mental health care, substance use services, making sure uh, that kids and others are protected um, in those kinds of environments. We really need to think proactively as a public health measure about how to deal with gun violence uh, that is self-inflicted. The second um, is there's some real challenges that our laws are having trouble uh, dealing with, um, and one of those is ghost guns, 3D printed guns. It is very hard to regulate, it is very hard to enforce. And then the third thing um, is interstate trafficking. There is a lot of circumstances uh, where things are unlawful here, um, but that they um, find their way over from other jurisdictions where we need to work with other states and we need to be vigorous to make sure that our, uh, our citizens are protected. Shannon, AG response to the striking down of a public carry law. Um, yes, I am very concerned uh, about a number of things that are on the U.S. Supreme Court's plate right now, and that and that is one of them. Um, and this is the type of work I've been doing throughout my career. Is I have uh, I've dealt with the issue of federal preemption and how do we get state laws to still be useful and applied in the face of federal preemption. Um, 
Uh, very proud of the fact that the, the Sandy Hook families recently were able to overcome federal preemption and finally get some justice um, all of these years later. As Attorney General, I will be a strong enforcer of our gun laws here in Massachusetts. We are fortunate to have some of the strongest laws in the country, but that Again, these laws do not enforce themselves. We need a strong attorney general who knows how to hold corporations accountable and do everything, I would do everything in my power as attorney general to figure out how to stop these guns that are coming in from other states. Uh, a big part of this is, is working collaboratively with other attorneys general across the country, including in neighboring states, because these are not simply Massachusetts issues. Again, I am the candidate who has done work on a nationwide level, gone after nationwide corporate bad actors, and won, and have coordinated successfully with lawyers and attorney general's offices elsewhere. So there is a lot that needs to be done. These ghost guns in Massachusetts are, are a huge problem, and I would be actively working with the legislature to make sure we get the most protective laws passed that we can that will withstand federal preemption challenges. Andrea? Um, thank you for the question. I, I too am concerned about the docket right now of the Supreme Court, um, not only in the context of guns, but also reprodu reproductive justice. Um, we should all be, frankly, very concerned. I do think there is a way in which the state of Massachusetts can continue to take the lead. I think the Roe Act and other types of uh, legislation, I remember testifying uh, as an elected in, in that conversation at the State House, there are ways in which for us to show up at the State House to advance legislation to continue to protect the rights we have here. Uh, but when you're talking about guns, clearly that should be a regional and a statewide conversation. Um, I think other states are welcoming that. The governor of New York obviously is also doing some innovative things to remove guns off our streets. And we should be at that table, too. So I do think there's a lot we can do through the State House if that were to come down, and of course, working with other uh, AGs and other states across the country, and to actually be at these tables in a greater way than we, just as we are with the opioid crisis or climate, for example. Um, and the other piece I, I wanted to stress um, in this context is, oh, I just lost my thought. It's all right. It happens to me all the time. Okay. That may mean we need to move on to another question. All right. All right. So, but it's okay because we have a lot more questions than we have time to ask, so it works out. Um, the Attorney General's Office litigates civil compensation claims by wrongfully convicted people against the Commonwealth. What is the first steps you will take to detect, correct, and prevent wrongful convictions in the Commonwealth, and what will your approach be to litigating civil compensation claims by wrongly convicted people? Andrea, we'll start with you. This is an issue, as you can imagine, I care deeply about because we know the disparities are real, especially for not only communities of color, but poor families um, who are criminalized for either mental health issues, opioid addiction, you name it. And we're seeing that even in our rural communities. And if you haven't been to the rural parts of the state, we have rural communities in Massachusetts where this is coming up. Um, I do think whether it's through the context of the criminal bureau or others in the civil rights division, they actually want, I think, more resources um, and more of a sign-off to actually take on more of these cases and to settle them in, in more creative ways. Um, I do think this connects to a conversation around what we were talking about earlier. The AG's office, what is so special about that office is you can look at issues through an intersectional lens, bringing together the divisions, the bureaus to address issues all at the same time. So if you're talking about this, you're talking about expungement, you're talking about sealing of records, you're talking about compensation, not just to the individual, the family. What's also coming up is what's restorative justice look like for a community in certain parts of Boston that I used to represent, whole communities, whole households and a whole street uh, were incarcerated or touched by the criminal legal system. And so it's not just about the individual, it's about families, it's about restorative justice for a community. And that's a large, larger conversation around prison reform, criminal legal reform, juvenile justice. These are the issues that will absolutely rise to the top of my, um, my office, um, and I would just, because it's so personal for me. Quentin. So I think our criminal justice system is fundamentally broken, um, and I have been a real admirer of the progressive prosecutor movement um, that uh, Rachel Rollins, for example, the Suffolk DA, has used innovative tools uh, to try to deal with uh, how we can 
um, uh, decrease the disparities in the criminal justice system. One of the tools has been to try to um, use non-prosecution of certain uh, offenses that have had a racially disparate impact um, and to incorporate evidence into that process so that we are looking in real time at what's working and what's not and scaling up the approaches um, that are going to help um, disentangle uh, this web of, uh, of injustice uh, that has come out of um, over-incarceration um, and uh, the broken war on drugs. And I think the AG has a really big role to play in this space. And I, I want to mention a couple of things that I think that we can do. One is we can use um, the tools that we have available to ourselves to model that kind of an approach. We need to be a progressive prosecutor in that mold, um, and we need to um, make sure that we're practicing what we preach. But we also need to use the thought leadership of the Attorney General's office to drive that progressive prosecutor movement. We need to do a better job of overseeing our police. I strongly believe uh, that we should move away um, from qualified immunity, for example, for police officers involved in altercations. Um, I think that we need to do a much better job of overseeing the Department of Corrections. I've called for a dedicated unit within the Attorney General's office to take complaints about mistreatment uh, from the Department of Corrections and to solve that. I'd like a formerly incarcerated person to be uh, part of our, our closest web of advisors. We need to make sure that those folks uh, who are incarcerated can vote, uh, that they can make phone calls, that we do much more to oversee the state police. I think that the Attorney General needs to be one of the main leaders in this movement uh, to bring justice to a criminal justice system that is fundamentally broken. Shannon. <clears throat> Kimberly, going, sorry. Kimberly, go, going back to your question about what the Attorney General's office can do um, about individuals who have been wrongfully incarcerated and deserve compensation. This is an issue that I have specifically been working with and strategizing with the ACLU about for years. Uh, because we have a very significant issue of wrongfully incarcerated people in our criminal justice system. In particular, coming out of the unbelievable scandals at the drug labs here in Massachusetts. We have been, our system, legal system has been dealing for years now with the fallout from that. And my concern for years has been all of those people who were wrongfully incarcerated, who had years of their lives taken away from them and the impact that their convictions and their terms in prison have had on their lives going forward for education, for job opportunities. So based on a recent decision that just came down from the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, it is now going to be easier for wrongfully convicted persons to obtain justice and compensation for that because the SJC recently made a landmark ruling that in order to obtain that type of compensation, you don't have to prove actual innocence, which has been a huge hurdle for actually obtaining that compensation. So I look forward as Attorney General to doing everything I can to make sure that there is justice for everyone who has been wrongfully incarcerated in Massachusetts. And, and this is an important issue that I've been talking about on the campaign trail. As a private attorney, I've gone up against the AG's office. I've gone up against the state plenty of times and I've won. I know that the state is not always on the right side of the issues. I know that sometimes the state itself engages in conduct that is indefensible. And in those situations, I will do everything I can to resolve the issues. And when it's not possible, I can appoint a special attorney general to play the role of the defense and I can take on the side of the plaintiffs because I, I've gone against the state. It's been using a discriminatory exam for years for hiring and promoting police officers and firefighters based on my work. I got the state to, I, I got black and brown police officers and firefighters hired across the Commonwealth. I plan to use this legal knowledge and experience to make sure that our state is complying with our laws. All right, just in recognition of where we are, we are in a law school. Our hosts are a law school. There is a class coming in after this. We have a hard stop of about uh, two minutes, but I want to give you each uh, 30 seconds to answer my favorite question, which what advice would you give your 1L self? I'll start with Shannon. <laughs> Uh, okay, my one L self, just keep, keep believing. Do what you want to do. Do where your passion lies. You didn't go to law school just to get a job to figure out how to pay off your law school debt. Um, there, is, uh, there are opportunities to do a lot of great work in the legal world and figure out what 
means the most to you and do it and it will, it will work out. Andrea. Get out of the building even more. Uh, you know, you're in law school, you're in all your classes, but it's important to, in hindsight, to get out and to engage with residents, organizations doing legal work or doing work related to our laws in a meaningful way to actually be able to bring what you're learning uh, into practice and to understand it in a deeper way. I spent too much time in the classroom. Yeah. Get out of the building. Quinn. I would say two things. First of all, the law can be an incredible tool for making a difference in people's lives. So figure out where your path is in the law that will be consistent with your sense of what you want to accomplish in the world. And the second part of that is related, which is keep your moral compass. The, one of the proudest things I ever did uh, as a young lawyer, I was called into the office of a law firm partner. I had just come after my clerkship, and they asked me to take on the defense side of a case involving a human rights violation. And I said, I won't do it. And they said, what do you mean you won't do it? And I said, I won't do it. And uh, they had never heard somebody say they wouldn't take on the case before, and I knew that meant that I had no a future in that firm. But I wasn't gonna do that work. So there have to be times as a lawyer where you say, I think this, uh, that the people are entitled to a, to a lawyer, but it doesn't have to be me. So keep your moral compass. Well, thank you to all of the candidates. I will turn it back to Lissy for final comments, if you don't have any. And I just want to say thank you. Our programs are intended to be educational, to illuminate issues, to be informative. And I think we have gotten a much greater sense of each of you. And for all of us who vote here in the Commonwealth, I hope you will absolutely make sure that you vote in the primary on September 6th, vote in the election. Voting is the greatest privilege of democracy. So thank you all for sharing your own work.